What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the basement. We got our boy Brent Lengel here. He is the creator of Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. You know, the basement has loved every issue of this so far. We reviewed issue one. I have issue two right next to me. Brent, welcome to the show, bro. Happy, happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me back. Anytime, man. This is actually, uh, this might be a first in basement history, as a matter of fact. I think this is the first time I'm ever going to get to review a book with the creator. Awesome. Matter. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a Kickstarter up for issue three right now, as a matter of fact. Correct. Yeah, we are running through till December 17th at 8 a.m. We asked for, for $7,000, and so far we've gotten, uh, let's say, check 17800 all right. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we break 1800. Uh, maybe maybe your uh, followers can help with that. <laughs> I certainly hope they can. This is a fantastic book. Before we talk about issue three, I have to bring up issue two. Now I have all the stuff from your last Kickstarter next to me. I've got my signed copy of issue one here, my Ashcan edition of the Reign of the Blood King. Issue two signed, and right, we're gonna delve right into that. And my two art prints, fantastic, <laughs> dude. I have to say right off the bat, one of the first things that I loved about this, and remembering that you're a Taekwondo practitioner, mm -hmm. the choreography in this book is awesome. <laughs> nice. Zell's jump kick when they're fighting the woodsman, bro. I'm I'm looking at that like 540 spin <laughs> kick when she knocks the axe out of his hand. That was. So dope. That's good. I'm glad. I will tell Luana that because I made her life a living hell making sure she got that exactly right. <laughs> it looked um, fantastic. Yeah. I, I should clarify, by the way. Um, so I have a, a third degree brown belt in Taekwondo, but I, I am actually a Shodan in uh, Kyokushin Karate. <laughs> Kyokushin, that was yeah. it. I am, I'm sorry. That's, a, that's perfectly all right. Because like I said, I, I do, and I talked a lot about Taekwondo the last time we were on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and you'll notice that the woodsman is a practitioner of Kyokushin Karate. <laughs> I, I noticed every strike was an us. Yep. <laughs> and I like the fact that, you know, being that he's so much bigger, his sidekick was a bit straighter, but obviously super strong. Like it knocked Zell back against the trees. But, you know, he's not doing it like these big flippy things like she was doing but you know when you get hit by one of them shots you're flying oh, the woodsman in the original new york production the fringe i played him one night not intentionally i didn't write it and be like i'm going to be the woodsman but the actor that we hired to be the woodsman got stuck filming i think house of cards and couldn't make it with like 24 hours notice so i had to learn all of the choreography and my own lines, but luckily I'd written them within 24 hours. And then I got on stage and had to do them. And I got to the end of like the first fight with Rapunzel. And I was just like, wow, this is actually really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> Should have left in more time to rest. <laughs> the woodsman fights like I fight. Um, you know, heightened for a comic book. But if you ever fight me, I'm people. They, I hit like a truck, and I don't like to move around a lot. It's just like boom train. <laughs> so that that was a lot of what he does is is taken from like the way that I personally like to fight. And I loved the you know that kind of the origin story of like the woodsman says to him, "Where were you when the world ended?" And mm -hmm. the prince is kind of explaining, like, well, we were in the castle and, you know, all of a sudden the people kind of start turning. And one of the, the most powerful lines I felt was when they were like, we closed the gates and we stopped letting the refugees in. And mm -hmm. it took a week and a half for the screaming to stop. And I'm like, wow, like that's <laughs> that's some heavy ass shit. Yeah. You know, I really wanted the upper class in this to be a feudal upper class and the kind of people that probably wouldn't let the refugees in. <laughs> you, you see both in like the way Charming's father talks about what it is to be a king. And, you know, when you have a zombie story, one of the important things to show is I think not literally, but figuratively, zombies tend to attack societies that are sick in some way. Is it 28 days or 28 weeks later when the when the military is like, I promised them women. Similarly, like Dawn of the Dead, they're attacking them in a shopping mall and you mm. see like the depredations of consumer culture or even in the original Night of the Living Dead that gave birth to the entire right. genre. Romero's taking on a lot of issues with regard to like institutional racism. Right. And so zombies in a in fiction, it's not just that they're zombies. It's that, in my opinion, the zombies 
appear almost as a karmic outgrowth of something that the society is doing. You don't necessarily want to focus on that really heavily, but I think that's a very important part of zombie lore that really gets overlooked. Mm -hmm. That's pretty deep. I never really, I never considered all of that, but you know, from, from a writer's standpoint, I can see how you're exploring all facets of the zombie genre. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, a book like this, some people pick it up and they think because of the title and the the subject matter that it's going to be just a, like a big parody of Disney stuff. And you're just going to see guts splattering. You will see a ton of guts splattering, but I really worked very hard to work in a lot of levels. Uh, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons. And, you know, like in The Simpsons, this is a show that rewards you for paying attention and being very well read. Mm -hmm. And there's always a million references. So there are things in these books that I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in the world who will get them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like six person jokes and 12 person jokes and uh, you know a, a, a hundred thousand and so you can get it on a number of levels or at least that was what i set out to do well that's important because you always you're going to find those few fans that were like hey i understood that reference you know <laughs> yeah. a little captain americaism in there like one of the things that you know i, I saw was and it, it just kind of it blows by real quick but when they're talking about you know how did you escape and it was like, oh, well, we, and Prince looks at Zell, like, well, we went, th we climbed down the wall. And you realize that she let her hair down. And that was, that seemed like the way she was holding her hair seemed like a very kind of, that was a pretty traumatic experience for her. Like, oh, yeah. This is why she cut her shit in the first place. Because mm -hmm. you see her in, you know, the big ball gown and everything. She's got her hair flowing behind her. There's at least two panels where you catch that. And now all of a sudden, you know, she's got the little, the bob, so to speak. Yeah. So that, well, that was pretty cool. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, that's something that's been in the story from the very, very beginning. Like, it was always that Rapunzel had her hair cut short. And mm -hmm. I really, like, when the character walked on stage, like, in my mind the first night that I was writing it, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely short hair sticking out all over the place. Because it shows how much this person has changed in just the 30 days. Um, than from what they were in in the story, because you know Rapunzel in her story, the the hair is her defined most defining right. character trait, and so the fact that she's had to give that up to survive in this world, I, I felt that said a lot about who she was. And, and it was an interesting, it was a really cool take on like you know the original concept of the story, where instead of the prince climbing up her hair, now they're literally climbing down, and yeah. you know as a mode of escape. <laughs> I, I like the juxtaposition there. And I don't know if I was reading too much into it or if that was one of the levels you were talking about, but... Um, I don't think I intended that juxtaposition, but now that you've seen it, yes, I did that. That was my, that was me. I intended it. <laughs> totally on purpose. <laughs> I like the giant, bro. Yo, and I... Like, the way they're describing him was like, like the pieces of bone kind of coming out because the giant was dead, which you find out in The Reign of the Blood King when Jack yeah. sort of killed him. Like, well... Well, it was the fall that killed him. I was like, wow, that's, that's messed up. Like, <laughs> made him fall. Like, but when I looked at the giant and the last thing, the last line, you're like, he looks almost jolly. And I'm like, the jolly green giant. I see, I see that. And it looked like when you look at the thing, it's like Cthulhu <laughs> swamp thing and doomsday had an unholy <laughs> love child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, by the way, Luana is the one that came up with that design, and I just loved it. And it also made it into, uh, this is a, the alternate cover for issue two that Brian Silverbacks did, which I just think is freaking phenomenal. Yeah. I also see a little bit of spawn in here. <laughs> I can, actually. You're right. Yeah. And uh, actually, that's an add-on to your Kickstarter, which I, I already right. added on when I kicked Sweet. in. <laughs> so essentially I had said to Luana make this thing look scary and she gave me a couple designs and she had the Cthulhu idea from the beginning that I loved but the first giant she gave me looked like kind of like a tree and I was like okay so this giant here this is you know he's he's not big enough and you, you th it looks great we may use this as a monster later and I love the Cthulhu thing but this dude's a freaking mountain he lives in the clouds so what can you give me and she gave me the animals perfect Hmm. Um, she's just I'm so lucky to be working with her it's always been the concept to move from artist to artist and at the end of each artist's run I'm always like oh my god how am I going to follow this up <laughs> so I've been very happy with it she's doing uh, issues two through four and then we'll be moving again I've confirmed with the artist that I'm working with but I'm not ready to announce but it's the most famous yeah. person I've worked with so far and they're going to be doing a berserk inspired thing from issue five on 
I'm intrigued. I can't wait to see this. To close out my gushing about issue two, when the woodsman is talking about like regular zombies versus the wolves. And <laughs> when you realize you have an entire other faction of big bad wolf style zombies. And like, okay, so they're half like werewolf and half zombies. Like, yeah, no, they don't saunter about. They're not dumb. They're actually smarter and far, far deadlier. And like one or two bites. And now they've got themselves a pack. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the wolves, this is kind of my original thing that I'm introducing to zombie lore. And that's the concept of like a zombie sire system, like vampires. So, and I might've mentioned this in the other one, but like basically in Swaza, because this is a magical disease, the zombie that bites you will inform what kind of zombie you turn into. So mm -hmm. if you get bit by like a, a magical zombie, like a fairy zombie or a wizard zombie, you might be a zombie that has magic. If you get bit by a wolf zombie, you gradually turn into a wolf and join their pack. If you get bit by the giant, we don't know what happens because the giant eats you whole most right. of the time. <laughs> but um, I, I'd be very interested if, if anybody in the series ever gets bit by the giant to see what actually happens to them. <laughs> Theoretically, there could be just a whole bunch of little zombies running around in his stomach. Who knows? There is, yes, that's a good idea that it might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is what I'm here for, man. This is brainstorming at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really like the idea of the four zombies as well, which we found out in Reign of the Blood King. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, he killed the, the cloud giant, but there's still the mountain one and... Uh, I can't remember the other two. I'm yeah, sorry. it was the, the giants of, uh, and by the way, just to correct you, because it's the reign of the blood covered king. Blood covered um, king. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's all right. Reign of the blood king sounds cool too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the giants that he gets sent by the king, it's the giant of the clouds and then the giant of the forest, the sea and the mountain. Right. Yeah, because there's a couple of fairy tales that I'm pulling from even in this. Every issue of Swaza is pulling from at least one fairy tale and usually more. This one actually, interestingly enough, and you'll love this because uh, this is something that pretty much only me and like really deep fa fairy tale buffs will get. The song that the peasant is singing in the first scene, my mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister Marlene, uh, gathered all my bones, tied them in a silken scarf, laid them beneath the juniper tree, tweet, tweet, what a beautiful bird am I. That that is literally word for word from the fairy tale, The Juniper Tree. I've never and, heard of that. Yeah, it's it's one of the more obscure ones, but I'm just like, I, I remembered, I was like, I need this peasant singing something. Is there anything, Is are there any songs in fairy tales, like not a Disney song? And then when I found this, I was just like, it's freaking perfect for Swaza with all the cannibalism and stuff. <laughs> I'm also pulling from the fairy tale of both Jack the Giant Slayer and the Brave Little Tailor slash Seven in One Blow, which is why he wears that sash, the Seven in right. One Blow, which is about a, a tailor who swats seven flies with a ruler uh, and <laughs> Just decides to proclaim this to everyone and everyone assumes that he means he killed seven men in right. a single blow. But in the brave little tailor, the evil king sends him off on increasingly dangerous quests, hoping that he will die. And that's what's implied here is essentially uh, Prince Charming's father doesn't want to pay him, doesn't want right. to incentivize other people. So, you know, hopefully he either kills us four giants or he dies. And either way, we're in, we're in good. Yeah, it, it discourages other idiots from trying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, the king's kind of a jerk, so oh, yeah. he kind of deserved what happened to him. Oh, yeah. And the king, I, I'm very interested. In my head, by the way, canonically, he sounds like Tywin Lannister. Like, that's who was kicking around my head when I wrote him. <laughs> he even kind of looks like him a little bit, but just a bit, you know, longer hair, maybe. I saw, like, the Tywin Lannister mentality there when he told Charming, don't worry, you can keep her, just not mm -hmm. in court. <laughs> I, like, when he was telling, yeah, he was telling Dinklage, for... like, you can keep yeah. your whores. Just don't bring them in public. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I wasn't thinking of that, but you're right. Uh, at the time, he did. Tywin did do something similar to that. Yeah. Well, one of the best scenes in Game of Thrones, in my opinion, is when Tywin is kind of dressing down Jamie while he's gutting the deer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think I unintentionally might have pulled a little from that because in issue two, there's the scene where the woodsman is cutting into the deer. Yeah, that's like, right. right at the beginning. I was doing that as a metaphor for innocence lost but yeah now that i think about it yeah so game of thrones is kicking around up here quite a bit <laughs> and well you know you kind of got to see like 
who Charming's father is and how he messed up his son. And we begin to see a little bit of this. We will see more of the blood-covered king, uh, both as a guy and as a zombie. So uh, as this side series continues, uh, and we're also going to see more of Jack in the series, which I'm really excited about. Oh, awesome. Hopefully one day he'll, you know, meet up with the rest of the party as like, you yeah. know, when it all comes full oh, circle. That, that will be happening. He will be weaving into the main storyline, starting with issue five, which I just finished writing and I'm super excited about. I saw that post as a matter of fact. Yes. Yeah. I'm going in a uh, Norse direction with that period, which I'm really, really excited about. Though I've got friends who are actually, you know, Danes and stuff stuff and they're like no horn helmets <laughs> <laughs> so i had to tell the the artist i'm working with i'm like don't i don't, I don't want to see a horn helmet on a viking <laughs> apparently they really don't like that sort of thing apparently not at least my, at least my scandinavian friends don't <laughs> So you have a already successful Kickstarter for issue three. Let's talk about the awesome rewards because you always have really cool shit going on. <laughs> I already got the add-ons. I, I picked up my variant covers because those are all dope. Tell us about those. Yeah, so we have some incredible variant covers. I really like the ones that we have this time around for issue three. The first cover is drawn by Luana and I absolutely love it. It's Snow White with the grimoire in the gingerbread witch's cabin, which is I'm doing a cabin in the woods kind of thing. The next cover is by Adam Bryce Thomas. We see the, there's a monster that is living in the gingerbread house, kind of on the roof and under the floorboards and it's our characters looking up at it on top of the gingerbread house. Adam Bryce Thomas is an incredible artist. I'm so lucky to have gotten him. And for those of you guys who don't know, he draws the IDW Sonic and Samurai Jack comics. Okay. The next issue is fan favorite Brian Silverbacks, and he did like a really great throwback to like a lot of the early image covers. And it's the super buff monster that is living under the floorboards that I really like. And then my, f my well, it's not my favorite. They're all my favorite, but one that I'm- This I'm one was my favorite. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm particularly excited about this is by Rich Waddell of Black Caravan. And it's actually a, a reference to Crime Suspense Stories number 22, the most infamous comic book cover of all time, because it, it was what kicked off the comics code. The Senate um, meetings and everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's the woodsman because he beheads a zombie in issue two. So it's the woodsman with the beheaded zombie head and and his axe. And the funny part is it, that is still being censored because I tried to run an ad for it on Facebook. And Facebook was like, no, 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 you can't run this. Censored. censored. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah, they, they will not allow me to make that into an ad. <laughs> Holy shit, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. I know it's it's a come it's from the 1950s. <laughs> come on, Zuckerberg. <laughs> I like the cool Kickstarter exclusive stuff. The variant covers, especially, is what's going to get my attention. And I like I go down, and I'm, as soon as I saw that one, I moved right over to the right hand side, and I'm like, "Where's the one for all the variant covers?" There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I mean, EC Comics was what got me into comics in the first place. My very first comic was a Vault of Horror issue two is the 90s reprints that my grandmother yeah. got me. So anytime I see something like that, or especially I'm, I'm like a sucker for homage covers. As <laughs> anything like that, I'm, I'm in. Like I, I'm all in cards on a table, whatever. So yeah, but uh, the covers are all fantastic and kudos to all the artists who worked on them. Yeah, absolutely. We also have two prints that are available. They're two exclusive prints. One is the original artist, Hyundo Park, did this incredible fantasy cover of Prince Charming. You can get that at the $50 level. Then the other one we've got is called Of Wolves and Gingerbread. <laughs> yeah. And that's done by Don Aguilo, who does Rise for Scout Comics. And I absolutely love it. So definitely check those out as well. So th there's a lot of original art that you can get through this that I I'm really excited about for the Kickstarter exclusive. And you always have some really cool shit for like the upper tiers of Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So I know the last one was a trip to Iceland with yep. you as the tour guide. With Which thank God no one bought because COVID. <laughs> yeah. Like what was going to happen then? So like what, what are the upper tiers now given, you know, COVID yeah. and everything? So we got three upper tiers. There's a level at 1,000 if you give, you can commission me to write something for you, either uh, like a short play or some piece of short fiction. 
for $2,000. You can get yourself a cameo as a Swaza character at this point. I used to charge $1,000 for that, but then I realized it, it actually makes me do a lot more work than I thought I would have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, b before I was like, oh, somebody gives me a thousand. Yeah, I'll put them in the comic. And then I'm like, dang it, past Brent. <laughs> so <laughs> I upped that to 2000 and we, we, we've we only got two of those available and one is already sold. And so like you will appear in at least three Swaza issues, though further on down the line, because we've already got the art for issue three done and I've got Luana working on the art for issue four. And you may also appear in some of the ash cans beforehand to introduce you as a character and you're guaranteed to have a name and a speaking role. And you may die in one of those three, mm. three appearances and I may choose to continue to use you bef long after that. Yeah, the beauty upon. of a zombie book is just because you die doesn't mean you're gone. Absolutely. And also the beauty of fairy tales. I I'm not going to say any more about that because much further on in the series, that will come into play. So that's really fun. Then at the highest level, that I believe it's $3,000, you can join a class that I teach, essentially. And we'll meet bi-weekly for a couple of months, and I will like take you through the process of creating your own comic. You know, I'll teach you how to do a Kickstarter, how to get it funded, how to attract an artist, and, you know, how to pitch it to pro publishers. So like all in all, I feel like they're really solid rewards and it's something that I would have really jumped at the chance to get involved in. Plus it's something that I'm technically involved in now as I'm taking a class from uh, Ron Martz at the moment. Oh, cool. So yeah, yeah. And he's the writer in case people aren't familiar. I figure they would be, but um, yeah, he's the writer for Green Lantern, Silver Surfer, Marvel vs. DC, and Witchblade. His class is also the reason why I thought to do the su Suspense Stories number 22 comic. <laughs> One of the unique benefits that I'm offering with this campaign is a link to the official Scout Comics Swaza playlist. This is a Spotify playlist starting at the digital level. Everybody gets a link to this Spotify playlist. And this is a list of songs to listen to as you read the comic or beforehand to put you in the mood. It may or may not be based on the playlist that I listen to when I write it. <laughs> um, but one of the bands on the list is called O oh Death. And they are a kind of like a dark roots sort of goth country band out of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. <laughs> actually. I, I feel like I should know these guys already. Like, I'm a little disappointed in myself. I have to look them up immediately. So now you mentioned the digital level. Talk us through those. What kind of offerings do we have for the digital stuff? So the digital stuff, I've got two levels. If you are giving either because you can't afford the, the high levels or you don't want to pay like for shipping. So, you know, I kept the shipping price as low as I could in the United States, but it's insane that I found shipping internationally. Um, so if you can't afford the international shipping on top of what you have, you just go at the digital. So at the $7 level, you're going to get a digital PDF of issue number three, and you will also get a digital PDF of Reign of the Blood Covered King. And since we have gone past it, you'll also get a digital PDF of Reign of the Blood Covered King Part 2. So that you get all that for $7. If you go up to the $12 level, that's going to be the digital catch-up. And you're going to get Reign of the Blood Covered King Part 1 and 2 digitally. You'll get issues 1 to 3 digitally. Issue 1 is 44 pages plus several additional pages. And issue 2 and 3 are about 22 pages each, I think. I may go one or two two over. <laughs> I can't remember. I always, I always push the 22 page limit because of creative reasons. Right, right. Well, that sounds fantastic. Actually, uh, you know what? I didn't even get a chance to look. What are the stretch goals? Um, so yeah, we have two stretch goals and I, I'm, I'm going to announce a third actually right now while I'm talking to you. Awesome. I, I love I just, a basement exclusive. Yeah, yeah. So P Pete's Basement exclusive. So the stretch goals that we've had for this one, the first stretch goal was to get Reign of the Blood Covered King Part 2, which we annihilated uh, early in the... I thought it would take a while, but w the, even before the first 10 days, we were already past that one. The second stretch goal is a huge digital comics pack. And this has some incredible creators on there. Dave Dwanch, David Pepos has put some in. I've also got links from other uh, scout creators. Brian Silverbacks uh, threw in a PDF for this. So you're going to get a huge digital download of some of like the best and most exciting indie creators like in the industry today. 
that goes out to everybody. I believe everybody in the Kickstarter. So that was the one we just broke at 17,000. And if we can break 20,000, I'm going to be releasing a pack of Snow White zombie cards for everybody. Um, so, so it's going to be cards with various characters on them. And I'm trying to decide if I want, how I want to do that. They may be playing cards. They may be tarot cards, but uh, th- those will be released if we can break 20,000. If the, the Pete's basement army wants to get on it, you can help push it over the, over the edge there. <laughs> Let's do it. PV fans. We got this. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's there's one other, if we get past 20,000, if I have to set another, I have a, a crazy goal that I'm not going to announce here, but it's going to be nuts. So <laughs> that would be the next stretch goal after after that one. So four potential stretch goals. And I'm going to add just a little bit more incentive. Uh, I figure by now we could probably say this. Uh, your favorite basement fucking comic talk show host actually makes an appearance in issue three. So if that's not enough reason to get issue three, I don't know what is. Yeah. (laughs) You make actually uh, two appearances uh, because you have an appearance in issue three as yourself. And then there's another character that I'm not going to go too far into because it's a spoiler, but is based on your younger self. (laughs) I I know exactly what it is. And we're not talking about it here. We're going to do that when we get the review of issue three in a few months. That's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. I look forward to watching your review on that. Oh man, I just reading through it and I, I I absolutely love this series, man. I can't wish you any more than all of the best of luck with it. I'm absolutely looking forward to all of these stretch goals because I am at you know at my base a greedy comic collector and I just want all <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> right, man. It's been great talking to you, brother. Absolutely. It's been terrific talking to you. Please, if anybody wants to find out where I'm at or what I'm doing, you can just follow me. Google my name, Brenton Lengel. Uh, I'm literally the only one in the world, so you will find me. My website, brentonlengel.com, looks like it was made in 2009 because it was. I'm, I'm getting that updated. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm also, I've got a YouTube channel now that's picking up steam. Just Google Brenton Lengel. It's on YouTube slash Despinon, uh, YouTube C slash Despinon. On that channel, I talk about politics. I do live debates. And I also talk about like philosophy and Buddhism and martial arts and art. <laughs> There's a great the interview. Whole cornucopia of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm a multifaceted individual. I, I also, uh, at Snow White Bones on Twitter is the official Twitter account. There's Snow White Zombie on Facebook and also, my Twitter is just at Brenton Langle, and you can follow me for all of that insanity. Also, I play Among Us with uh, several oh, cool. prominent streamers and artists. And um, yeah, we there, there, there's some wonderful Among Us moments where, you know, basically we are betrayed by our friends after lying to them because that's fun. <laughs> apparently. That's life, apparently. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's where everybody can find me. And uh, I'm going to be continuing to produce Snow White Zombie comics uh, as long as you guys want to read them and we're able to keep them funded on Kickstarter, which considering the response we've had to the first two, I think is very likely. And yeah, there's probably several other cool comic things I want to do, you know, so uh, just just keep an eye on it. (laughs) You can count on the basement support, brother. I love this series. I loved it since issue one. I laughed my ass off. Issue two was great, meeting new characters, and I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Lots of luck, man. Salud. Thanks for coming on. You guys out there in Peach Basement Land, head over to kickstarter.com. Search Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Kick in if you can. There's a lot of great stuff, a lot of awesome rewards. And, of course, follow Brent, follow Swaza all over social media. And, of course, you know how to get in touch with us. Questions at peachbasement.com, facebook.com forward slash peachbasement, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, at peachbasement. Let us know what you're reading. Let us know what you're kicking in on. We always want to hear from you. See you next time. Salud, everybody. Salud. <laughs> Peach Basement is copyrighted 2020. Ripped Productions. All rights reserved. So go fuck yourself. Another thing uh, to look for also is um, I wasn't able to go to Dragon Con this year, uh, but I'm working on a novel uh, with uh, the, the, I might've mentioned them the last time. Uh, it's a goth band called the Crew Shadows, uh, C-R-U-X Shadows. Oh, dude, you're going to love them. Check them out. Um, the Crew Shadows are, imagine Lady Gaga, but Lady Gaga's a guy 
fronting a mostly girl goth band singing about angels and Greek mythology. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's um, they're really, really cool. Uh, they've actually beaten out Madonna and Beyonce for the number one dance hit in the world in 2005. And me and the lead singer are, are collaborating on a uh, fantasy novel that begins when the main character dies and wakes up in the afterlife. So that, that, that's right. the other big project I have on the burner right now. <laughs> I I had the privilege of doing one choreographed fight in my whole life, and it was about five minutes. And after we were done, like you kind of went backstage and were like, <gasps> like holding on to something because you can't show it out there. But you know, and I mean, it's the same thing as being in a sparring match or a fight. Don't don't show the other guy you're tired. No, definitely. And certainly no. don't show Sensei you're tired, or you'll be fighting for another ten minutes. <sighs> I'll, I'll tell you, I had to, when I w was getting my, my show done, I had to do a 15-man kumite. So 15 two-minute fights in a row, no rest, after a three-hour workout at the end of a four-day retreat in the mountains, um, in which I injured myself on the first day. <laughs> and I was, like, sitting there, and I was like, I have never, I, like, okay, um, I, I like after fight three, I was like, Oh, I don't know if I can do this fight five. I definitely can't do this. Like fight 10. What's my name again? Fight 14, <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to do this. <laughs> then I puked twice. It's completely understandable. Sometimes you get that tired. And for anybody that doesn't actually know what Brent's talking about, uh, Kyokushin is like fucking mortal Kombat. It's like, you just going up the ladder and in order to get your, your belt, you have to fight these guys and i believe there's no head contact but it's all like chest and body and leg kicks and no gear uh, there is head contact um, okay. but it, you can only kick in the head you can't punch in the face or mm. punch to the head because um we we yeah we 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 train to fight bare knuckle now in a, if you're doing it in a belt promotion there will be gear on but it's okay. still full contact um but you you're training to fight bare knuckle no gear and people will do multiple fights within a single day which is just mind-blowing um, and, and yeah, it, it's Kyokushin Karate in my Buddhist organization, you know, I have a number of Buddhists from Japan. Um, and, uh, one of them came up to me and was like, what, what, what style are you studying now? And I'm like, Oh, Kyokushin. And he's like, Oh, that's the badass one. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely got a reputation in the martial arts world without question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. And um, my dojo is incredible. Um, uh, Shihan Michelle Gay is like, she she did a hundred uh, woman kumite uh, and, and made it past like 60, 61 fights to uh, get to like retire from uh, fighting and move into teaching. Like, right. <laughs> Now, let me ask you a question before we continue on with the book. Uh, they, these guys, like they're not taking it easy on you. Like they're, they're, are they tr ridiculously trying to stop you from proceeding? Yes. And th these these are people that I've trained with, um, who I know. And actually, I got to one point in the fight where I was feeling so I didn't even mean to say it, but like this voice just came out of me where I was just like, "Please stop." <laughs> the guy who was uh, Brendan will love this because he's a fan of the series, so he's probably going to see this. Um, uh, uh, Brendan uh, was just up there, and he's like, "I'm not going to stop." And boom, <laughs> like, oh God, that was a mistake. Um, I do feel really good though because in the in the uh, fight I um, I think like the by my fifth fight or so I was fighting um, Sensei Hugo um, and he's a bit smaller than me but he's really tough and he the name implies in such. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and he moved in on me and I, uh, this is not a legal Kyokushin move, <laughs> but I did the, 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 the double trip where you bring your leg and you hook their back leg and then you uh -huh. knock them over that way. And he just went down and I was just like, yes. <laughs> and afterwards, um, uh, my Shihan was like, yeah, that's, that's not legal, but I wasn't going to stop it. <laughs> Let's just don't do it again. Yeah, but I'll tell you, I felt so manly after that. Just boom! <laughs> if the world ever goes back to normal, you know, maybe around the time like Swaza 5 is coming out and we can actually see each other, perhaps the next Kickstarter interview will just be a sparring match between that us. That sounds amazing, and I bet you we'd get a bunch of... I, honestly, I can already start counting the YouTube views on that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds... Uh, yeah, that would be really great. So let, let's hope we can make that happen. Seriously. I'm a multifaceted individual. I, I am large. I contain not multitudes. That's a that's a demon thing. I'm a conspiracy theorist. So ah. if you, if you ever want to like if you ever want to put that tinfoil hat on, 
I'd love to reverse this podcast <laughs> and talk about that stuff. And also, I'm right all the time and everyone is wrong. To yeah, consider obviously. yourself insane is self-defeating, I find. It's the rest of the insane world that can't cope with my version of sanity.